in research on dieting. It's called What the Hell Effect. I've already ruined everything. I'm just going to give up on my diet entirely and eat everything that I, I want to eat. But with habits, you don't have to worry about doing it absolutely every single day. Because the beauty of habit memory is it forms slowly and incrementally and only changes that way too, very slowly. So you don't do it for a day, two days, that's fine. Your habit memory will still be there when you come back and start up again. Wendy, it is so great to be with you today. Super to be here. All right. So I got my first question, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot because uh, it's the relatively the new year. We're already in February. I, I don't know where the time's going, but everyone has started the year. I, I shouldn't say everyone. Statistically, a quarter of Americans have started the year with a New Year's resolution, and statistically, most of those folks have fallen off or have already kind of abandoned that. And if you look at um, the studies that have been done, at least the ones I looked at, it seems like a minority of folks will actually accomplish the goals they set out to for 2022. Uh, 8% is, is the stat that I read. I don't know if you have any something around that, but just curious, generally, like when I think about that, I think of habits and they jump off the page. How do habits play into resolutions? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, some of the sports apps have this thing they call quitting day. Mm -hmm. So they can actually estimate when <laughs> in January, most of us are going to quit exercising. So we're going to give up on our um, New Year's resolutions. And part of the reason that we find it so difficult to change behavior is that we don't, is that so often we're trying to change habits. We have a sort of an ingrained pattern that we've been following and not thinking a whole lot about. And then the new year gets us to reevaluate and we try to change, but we don't really understand what our habits are. Habits aren't accessible to conscious awareness. They're not something we know in the same way that like, you know what you like and you know what your beliefs are, and you can feel emotions and moods. Habits aren't like that at all. We can't introspect about them. They're part of the unconscious. And habits form slowly, and they decay only slowly. So by the time the third week in January comes along and it's Quitter's Day, our motivation has sort of waned, but our old habits are still there in full force. And we just get tired of fighting them. So we think, well, maybe we didn't really want to do this that much. Or maybe it isn't that important. I'll try again later. I'll figure out something else later. And we, we give up. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So when you hear the... 8% that actually stick with it. What are some of the things that they do? And I know in your book is filled with um, tons of great ways. And that's what I love about your book. It's like, here's how to do things to increase the probability of you sticking with a habit, like habit stacking, making an ideal um, environment. And we'll dive deep into those. But is there one that kind of sticks out that you'd have to, you'd say, the people that do this have a higher likelihood of making their habit a uh, turn into something that helps them achieve their goals? Yeah, I think probably, I mean, there are two, two really important things to consider, and I'll answer with one of them. We, and that is, you need to figure out a way to make the new behavior enjoyable. So, so often we tackle things that we don't really want to do, like make myself eat more vegetables, make myself exercise even though I hate it. 
um, make myself save money, even though it makes me feel like I'm denying myself things. All of those feelings are real and they get in the way of us repeating a behavior. So if there's some way that you can figure out how to make the behavior more enjoyable in some way, you're much more likely to repeat it and form a habit. And you can do this with almost anything. So my parents were very careful with money to the point that they were really careful with money. <laughs> and they it was kind of ridiculous to me because they weren't horribly poor. I mean, they weren't wealthy, but they weren't horribly poor, but they were so careful. And they never felt like they were denying themselves anything. They had figured out things to do that made them feel like they were smart, not spending money, that it was a positive thing, that they were getting a lot of value for very little outlay. And to them, that was really rewarding. So they looked forward to opportunities to buy something on sale, wait until something was cheaper, they could find it used. This was, uh, this was fun to them. And it was definitely their habit. So if you can figure out some way like that to make your behavior fun, then you're, you've done half of the work to making a habit. That makes sense. I, I know you mentioned Warren Buffett. He's a classic example of someone that lives in the same house for the last 50 years and and uh, ha drives around a Cadillac from, from what I know. And I visited one of the restaurants in Omaha that he goes to a lot and there's this big cutout of him and he just <laughs> has a steak and a Diet Coke at this little restaurant. He lives just very humble life. And I think that that has to be fun for him to live on what he lived on before. Otherwise, he would do, he can easily do something different. He has all the means in the world to, to do that. Yeah. It's, it's when you get into repeating behaviors that somehow work for you, that are rewarding, that are enjoyable, then what happens is that your brain releases dopamine. And that's a neurochemical that we think of as um, something to do with enjoyment, but it does lots of things. And one of the things it does is it connects what you're doing in a given context that got a reward. So it starts to build those habit memories. And the thing about dopamine is it works for a really short amount of time, seconds, to tie together all that information. So giving yourself a reward at the end of the week isn't going to do much. Dopamine's gone. It has to be when you're doing the behavior. Mm. Yeah, and you can see that either through shopping online, you get this instant feeling of like, yeah. And then as soon as you walk away from your computer, you're like, oh yeah, that's going to show up. And then it shows up, maybe you get another uh, instant kind of shot at dopamine and social media is obviously a big, a big place where that happens too. And that's why I, I believe it creates the addiction that especially kids and even, even myself, like when I make a post or something and see that instant gratification or comments, it's very pleasing. Yeah. Social media really has hijacked our habits. <laughs> it knows. It's, it's as if it is designed by a habit researcher to get us to keep using it. And, and it's no surprise because um, some research that my lab has done um, has shown that social media sites fail or succeed based on the number of habitual users. So it's not a broad user base necessarily, right? So if everyone uses a social media site once, that's not going to be that helpful to that particular site. They rely on repeat users who get on the site, stay on it, hit ads, do other sorts of things that start generating revenue. So 
it's no accident that social media sites have figured out how to build habits and they do it so well. That's their business model. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And the algorithm is designed for that exact thing. Like, in fact, if I'm going to make a post, like when I share this podcast, as an example, I'm going to post it on social media sites and Instagram doesn't even let you link off to another place unless you run an ad. Facebook does, but their algorithm works in a way where it will actually not show my post to as many people if I put a link in there that takes the user to an external site. Therefore, I have to wait, post it, then I have to put in the comment, if you like, check out Wendy's episode, because it's obviously gonna look it's it's gonna link externally. And now they're doing things they're like, oh, we notice a lot of people are linking to podcasts. Well, let's ingest the podcast ourselves to keep the user on Facebook. And the the cycle continues. And that's why Google has the knowledge graph now. And you, Google gives you answers in the search results without taking you to an external link. Yeah, they all want to keep you there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they also curate your feeds, right? So they're giving you what you want to see on average um, to keep you, to keep that hit of dopamine going and to keep you engaged and interested. So... Social media is is a challenge unless you know how to control it. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd say it was an addiction because addiction refers to um, typically to substances that have some physiological change to them. Um, they create some internal change in your physiology and you probably won't go into any sort of um, uh, an, any sort of withdrawal state if you get off social media, <laughs> right? Not in the same way as you would as an alcoholic would who quits drinking. So I'm not sure that I go with that label, but there's certainly habit forming. Yeah. Well, it's, it'd be it'd be interesting. Um, we could go down the rabbit hole on this all day um, to see how, if, if in your lab you're recreating anything to show the impact it's going to have on children that have grown up with nothing but that instant gratification. Because that, and there's ton of there's tons of books on that. But I don't know if you have anything personally before we we move on, just to touch on that for a second. Um, well, the interesting thing is that. Children don't form habits in quite the same way that you and I do because they don't have the, neuro, we call the neural maturity. Their brains aren't fully developed yet and they're not able to organize their behavior in quite the same way that we do and represent it in, in their memory in quite the same way we do. So people sometimes worry about the habits that kids form and I tell parents that they are the biggest habit structure in most kids' lives, um, that the structure that they provide and the family provides is going to be the thing that is most important in kids' development. Yeah, I think that's, that's so right on because when my uh, children, I feel like, have too much devices, I see it in their behavior, but that's on me. That's not them. They're the nine and 11. So I'm, and then I have to develop better parameters around that. And sometimes the easy way out is just to, you know, if I'm doing something or I want to watch a movie with my wife, it's like, Hey, I'll just give you more time on your iPad. And exactly. it comes back on me. Right. It's not, it's not really them. And, and once they're off of it, guess what? They find something else to do. And it's usually a lot more productive and their mood changes. So you're right on there. I, I take full blame for that, but it's, it's something that's an well, obvious every problem. Every parent has done that. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you. So, it's good for you that you don't always do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the th one of the things in in the book and and from your research that I found fascinating is we we all have this idea of of a number like how many times do I have to do this or how many days in a row do I have have to do this for it to become a habit and that number's changed a lot over time but your research shows it's about sixty five days mm -hmm. and uh, I have a I have a, a personal um, uh, 
uh, thing that happened to me where last year I did this, or a couple of years ago, I did a 75 day challenge. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what, after when I hit that 75 day mark of forming these really good habits, it, it felt like, um, it would, it was really easy to continue on. And in, in, to this day, I'm still doing a lot of those habits and it really put me on this great trajectory that I wouldn't have been on otherwise if I just listened to the, oh, just do it for 21 days and it'll be a habit and so forth. So I was just curious, like, what insight you have around that 65-day mark? Well, this was one of my postdocs who um, did a very clever study where she had people repeat a simple health behavior once a day. And, and people got to choose what behavior to repeat. And, and they were just what you'd think, right? I'm gonna take a walk after dinner. I'm gonna have a piece of fruit at breakfast, that kind of simple health behavior. And that's where the evidence about two months, two more complex behaviors closer to three months um, comes from. And that's because habit memory doesn't it isn't created by our decisions. It's not like you can decide, oh, I'm going to form a habit today, so let me go out and make a decision and I'm going to do it. It doesn't work that way. Habit memories, we learn incrementally each time we do something. And ultimately, at the end of two to three months, you should experience the behavior as relatively automatic. You don't have to think that much in order to do it. So that's the point at which you know a habit has formed. And if you stay in the same context, keep living in the same place, keep following the same everyday routine, it should be pretty easy at that point to maintain the habit. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. So now I want to talk about what are some of the suggestions, I alluded to these earlier, of some things I could be doing, the listeners can be doing to actually start to develop these habits. And then I want to get into, not to jump the gun here, but I, I want to say this out loud so I, I don't forget how to stop with bad habits, like picking up the phone, like walk me through the morning of my life. And like, I, as much as I tell myself, don't pick up the phone, it's so habitual to pick up my phone and look at it first thing. But but let's let's touch on the first things first. And what can I do to start to develop better habits if I want to start doing X today? Well, what most of us do when when we want to start to do, to do something new is we think of the reasons why we should do it. We convince ourselves, we try to motivate ourselves, we exert some willpower, try to make it, get it done. Um, but white knuckling is not a good way to actually start a new behavior. Just because our motivation wanes, right? It goes away. Things that, aren't, that we aren't already doing, that we have to think about and then struggle a bit with and then talk ourselves into it, People just aren't built to keep doing that over and over and over again for two to three months until a habit forms. Most of us just aren't going to be successful doing that. When I was writing this book, I had such a wonderful experience going up to the Culinary Institute of America, and I got to actually shadow some of the new chefs as they were going through the first week in their program. And the chefs were just like us, starting a new behavior, right? They wanted to jump in and start cooking. They were there to make stuff, cook stuff. And, and what the instructors had to teach them is a better strategy. And it's a great strategy because it works for all, all behaviors. And that's, what's called mise en place. Get everything in its place before you start. So these poor chefs who were really prepared to jump in and, and, and start, they had to stop and organize their workstations so that they had everything there, all the pots, all the um, 
the ingredients. It was all organized in the right order. In order to be successful at cooking the same, cooking the same things over and over again, they had to do it each time. And it's a lesson that beginning chefs have to learn. It's something that we all need to learn in our own lives, which is you don't jump in and try to start stuff until you have set up the context to make it easier for yourself to do it. So that's the way to think about starting a new behavior. How do you make it easy? And that just kind of sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, if it was easy, you'd already be doing it. But there are things you can do to remove the barriers that are making a behavior hard. For example, if you want to go to the gym more often, there's great data showing that people who go to gyms close by go much more often than people who join gyms and they have to travel a further distance. And we're not talking about like much distance, like a mile, a mile and a half more, you don't go. And that's not how we think about it, but it's really how our behavior works. If you're interested in forming a new habit, you have to focus on the influences on your behavior, not the influences on your thoughts and feelings and why you should do it and your commitment. Focus on the forces that work on the behavior itself. And so distance is bad if you want to start doing a new behavior. Time delays are bad. And Amazon knows this, right? They got successful in part through their one-click ordering system. All you have to do is hit a button once and you got stuff at your door the next day or the day after. They knew that two clicks and they're losing customers. So <laughs> what works for Amazon also works for us. Make it easy, reduce time, reduce distance, reduce effort as much as you can so that you set up your environment so you're making it easy to repeat the behavior. So that's the second key. We talked about, I said that there were two. One is make it rewarding or fun in some way. And the second is make it easy. Change your environment in some way so that you can repeat it on a regular basis. Yeah. And the stat you have in the book to talk about the mileage and the distance principle is like, if you're five miles away from a gym, compared to a mile and a half, like you're what, two to three X more inclined to go to the gym if you're that mile and a half away versus five miles away. Like that's the difference of that. So when you're looking at gyms as an example and you want to start that behavior, that should be the first thing you're looking at because that because the stats show that you're going to be much more inclined to stick with that. Exactly. That's yeah. the whole logic behind have your running shoes by the door. Sleep in your running clothes. If you want to go first thing in the morning, make sure you always have your workout kit in your car if that's where you go to the gym from. Whatever you can do to make things easier will make it more likely that you do the behavior. For, for me, I um, have found that if I go to the grocery store and I buy the freshest vegetables I can find, they sit in my fridge because it's a lot of work to pull out vegetables, figure out what to do with them, cut them up. If I can buy them already partially prepared mm -hmm. and then maybe just add a few fresh herbs or something to them, I'm much more likely to eat vegetables. And I didn't do that for a long time because, as I said, my parents were very careful about money. And so buying already prepared vegetables seemed like a waste. But it's less of a waste than buying vegetables you don't eat. So you have to figure out what is the thing for you that's going to make it a little easier. 
Yeah. No, I think that's that's so true. Like cutting up an onion, so laborious. Then when I see chopped onion, I'm like, oh, great. What can I cook with that now? Versus like your eyes are watering and you're trying to cut this thing and you get half of it right because you're doing the technique and then the other half's a disaster. Exactly. But, yeah. And then you have to clean yeah. it all up afterwards. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who wants to do that? But yeah. if you can make it easy, you're going to benefit. So you touched on something earlier and I'm, I want to just understand this a little bit more because many times when I'm developing a new habit or when I'm training for something, it's not necessarily I really enjoy doing it, but it's it's almost like I know I should be doing it. I know I need to get through this period of difficulty. An example would be um, I've been in jujitsu for the last year and a half and even today when I went this morning, I had a lot of friction. I was just like, man, I got to 6.30 in the morning. I'm going to go through this adversity of getting literally like choked out before I eat my breakfast. And all this, my mind's playing like this. There's nothing fun about it. However, as soon as I'm done with it, I'm like a cloud nine and I have this energy and I just feel great. But it, it made me think like also when I train and I see other people train for things like my wife's a good example. She doesn't like running, but she will sign up for a race. How do you balance going through the things that just are not great or not enjoyable with accomplishing your goals and developing habits toward them? Well, part of the, um, you know, the rewards you get from doing behaviors can be lots of different things. And pride is one of them. Um, if you can f- make yourself, um, convince yourself that what you're doing is really admirable and it makes you feel good because of that, that in, a, in and of itself is a reward. So sometimes it's just figuring out how to think about something to make it more rewarding. Now, People who hate vegetables aren't going to, that's not going to work. People who just hate to work out, that's not going to work for them. They're going to need to find something that's a bit more uh, tangible. So if you hate to work out at the gym, maybe you like going for walks. Maybe you have friends that you want to spend time with and could walk with. So then it becomes enjoyable. Or maybe you would listen to your favorite podcasts while you work out. That could make it enjoyable. Or if, if you like to wear really fancy workout clothes and show them off at the gym, maybe that's gonna be a kind of a reward. <laughs> so whatever it is that appeals to you, it's gonna be really different than what appeals to me. But that reward is something that you can keep in mind as something that that you can overlay onto the behavior. It doesn't have to be part of the behavior itself. And that's something that we've learned as psychologists, even in the past five years. Psychologists used to be really focused on what rewards are intrinsic or inherent in a behavior and what rewards are extrinsic. And we used to think they were really different things. Now we know what matters is the reward happens now when you do the behavior. It doesn't matter whether it's intrinsic, extrinsic, whatever. Just make sure it happens when you do the behavior, and then you'll be more likely to repeat it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So enjoyable, remove friction. And then what about habit stacking, like creating a time to do a habit that's in line with something else you're already doing. How important is that? That can be a really effective strategy. We did some research on um, consumer products, and we all hear that new products are introduced every year. It's really hard. So many fail. Well, we asked consumers what they were doing when they bought a new product and kept using it as opposed to buying a new product and then just sort of ending up sticking it in your drawer and not using it. One of the things that people did that was most successful was this habit stacking. So they would take the new product, 
and add it on to something they were already doing. So it's like buying floss, dental floss, and adding it on to brushing your teeth. So you already have a habit to brush your teeth morning and night. So one of those could be a time when you also, you have the dental floss sitting right next to your toothbrush. Even better, dental floss already cut into pieces. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but this works. <laughs> There's a reason. <laughs> Again, think about Amazon. One click, two clicks. Um, dental floss, easily accessible right there. If you have a habit to brush your teeth, having the dental floss right there that you can tie onto that habit makes it much more likely that you'll actually use it, even if you weren't a flosser to begin with. Make your dentist happy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've also read in the past, too, if you're going to start flossing your teeth, just say to yourself, I'm just going to do one tooth today, and then maybe the next day do two teeth and Obviously, you're probably not going to just do one, but if you tell yourself that, then then it helps as well. Maybe. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I've heard that before, and I just don't think there's any research data on that. Sounds good. Yeah. So, yeah. Who knows? I guess just, no just less, less friction for yourself, when I, I guess, when you think about how many uh, teeth you have to floss. But nonetheless, so, <laughs> so how... Um, or let me ask you this. You, you mentioned in the book, habits don't crave variety. And I think that was so important to for me personally to understand power of routine. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah. So our habits, once you've formed a habit, what happens is you're in the context the familiar context that you were in when you formed that habit, and the habit automatically comes to mind. So that is actually the secret power of habits, is their speed. Cognitive psychology has shown us that people act so often before they take time to think. And if you make them act quickly or distract them or stress them. They just act on habit without thinking. So speed is really important. And we actually did some research on this with habitual runners, where we activated thoughts of where they typically ran. And running quickly came to mind for habitual runners. But their goals for running, why they ran, didn't help them think about running and jogging because the behavior was tied to the context. It was a habit for them. And if you change context, you're not going to be activating those same behaviors. And that's one reason why when we move or start a new job or start a new relationship, we find ourselves making decisions a lot because we don't have the old habits being activated to guide us. And it can actually be quite tiring to constantly be thinking and deciding. And that's what habits do is they free us from that. They streamline our decision-making so that we just do what we did in the past. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I also know you talk about the repetition and going back to the 65 days or so, it depends on what the habit is you're trying to attain. But one of the, one of the, um, I should say pleasant things that I found out within your research is that even if you start down this habit train, if you will, and you, you're consistent, even if you miss a few days, that's okay. And I think, I think I personally get really hung up on streaks. And if I miss a day that I'm like, oh, I got to start over and it's less, it's harder for me to get back on that train. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's easy to sort of talk yourself when you are forming a new habit. It's easy to get discouraged and think you've ruined it. 
In fact, there's a, there's a, a label for this in research on dieting. It's called what the hell effect. I've already ruined everything. I'm just going to give up on my diet entirely and eat everything that I, I want to eat. But with habits, you don't have to worry about doing it absolutely every single day. Because the beauty of habit memory is it forms slowly and incrementally and only changes that way too, very slowly. So you don't do it for a day, two days, that's fine. Your habit memory will still be there when you come back and start up again. It's the old idea of riding a bike, right? You never forget how to ride a bike once you learn. Our habits are like that. So I promised I'd circle back and just given time, I wonder if you can incorporate um, a, a segment from your book, a chapter on this, in this answer, if that makes sense, but bad habits. And I know we learned a lot and I thought it was fascinating, your research from Vietnam vets, from, from the book. So uh, if you can expand on that and one, I've the bad habit that I had mentioned earlier of checking my phone in the morning. How can I take steps to not do that? And then secondly, what did VS Vietnam teach us about, uh, about habits? Okay. Well, let's start with your phone <laughs> because we all have this challenge. We are all a little bit too tied to our phones and that's because they're just so frigging accessible. We can use them anywhere. We take them to bed, so we look at them last thing at night, first thing in the morning. You can take them into office meetings and look at them during meetings when you're feeling bored. That phone use is cued just by looking at the phone. Using it comes to mind. <laughs> and we use it so much. We all have strong habits to use our phones. So if you want to control phone use, there's a couple of things you can do. This is where the whole idea of changing the environment comes in to play. So yes, if you want to start a new behavior, you want to make it easy. If you want to control an existing habit, you want to make it a little bit more difficult to do the behavior. And so you don't want to give up your phone. None of us want to give up our phones. But what you want to do is you want to just make it so that you have to think just a little bit before using it. So even turning it on its face at an, in a meeting so you can't see the notifications and other things that happen on your phone is really helpful. It's also helpful if you start keeping your phone in, uh, in your purse, in a backpack, in a briefcase, so that it's not immediately accessible. You have to reach for it. And that reach is a slight amount of friction. And it's enough to stop us from using our phone when we aren't really committed to doing so. We have to think about it and then make a bit of a decision. So it doesn't stop us from doing it. It just makes it slightly less likely. And that's all we want. We just want to gain control over the phone, <laughs> getting this back. Um, there's another thing you can do, which, is, which I think is very clever, and that is put it to grayscale. There's great research showing recently that people who put their phone to grayscale use it less. Hmm. You can't really distinguish all of the icons in quite the same way. So you have, to, you have to work more to use your phone. And it's also not quite as rewarding. It looks different. And so it, both of those things stop us from using it quite as often. So I highly recommend if you're trying to gain control of your phone, keep it someplace where you have to reach for it unzip something and make that your habit. And then also to put it back there when you're done, 
<laughs> and also put it on grayscale. And I think you'll find that that's, that will be helpful. And, you know, this is going to be such an issue for this next generation. So I have amazing college students working in my lab. They volunteer. These are the A students in college. And I was asking them the other day, so how, how long each day do you spend on social media? Four hours. Mm. <laughs> Four hours. And these are the kids who are so productive and so successful. I, this is a challenge for people. <laughs> this is not something that only people who, are, who have low self-control or no goals in life suffer from. We all do. And we're all going to learn, have to learn how to get control over it. Yeah. No, I think that's right on. And I've, I've uh, got away from using a computer when I'm in meetings or taking notes on an electronic device, except this electronic notebook that's not connected to the internet. But it, it allows me to have efficiency. And, and that's something I, that's something that's a big, positive when you could, you know, an Evernote or, or Apple notes, and then it saves to the cloud and you could pick it up on, on another device really hard with a piece of paper to make that happen. But I think you'll see more and more devices coming out. I'm sure, I'm sure you're already seeing this, that take away that, um, distraction of, of social and the web. That's right. It's, it, we have this idea that connectivity all the time is a great thing. It's really not yeah. controlling it. It's a great thing. Yeah. So, so let's uh, let's touch on Vietnam because I thought this was fascinating research in, in your book. Um, if yeah, you can, yeah, this is that not in. my research, but this is research on addiction. So habits are different from addiction. Habits are a behavioral response that we learn. And habits are both good and bad, right? Although we tend to think about our bad habits really a lot of our habits are good. That's how people who write a whole lot, that's how they do it, is they have a habit of going to a certain place, writing for a certain amount of time each day or a certain number of pages. They've just set that up so they're not struggling with the writing anymore. Habits are really beneficial most of the time. We notice them when they're not beneficial. That's why we think a lot of our habits are bad, but really most of them are good. They're working for us in some way. Now, addiction is partly dependent on habits and partly dependent on physiological and other changes that occur when you start using addictive substances. And one of the, the really awful things in about the Vietnam War, and there were so many awful things. But one of them is that a lot of the vets over there, a lot of the soldiers over there, they were soldiers, um, a lot of the soldiers actually were exposed to using heroin and used it reasonably regularly. They were in an awful situation and drugs were one escape at the time. And I've talked to some, um, some of the Vietnam vets who were over there, and it was horribly challenging. But, and, and to have so many soldiers using heroin while they were there looked like it was going to be a huge challenge at the end of the war when the soldiers came home, right? We would have all these addicted guys and women in the streets, and what are we going to do with them? Um, but that's not what happened. What happened was when the context changed, so they were no longer under that horrible stress with few options of things to do other than take drugs and fight, um, the, the, the soldiers, when they came home, they, most of them, were able to return to normal lives quite readily. And that was a huge surprise because we think of addiction as hard to quit. But what it suggests is that addiction is as much 
in the environments that we're in as it is in ourselves. And that's something I have learned from habit research that I didn't think was important to begin with, but has become increasingly clear is that we think we're in charge of our behavior and we're making decisions and we're doing things because we want to or we're addicted and we have to. Or, But instead, so much of what we do is really dependent on the environments that we're in. And so many of our current let me edit, editorialize here, that I think so many of our current challenges in health, in saving, in having um, rewarding relationships with other people, so many of them are a function of the environment, of how we live, how we've structured our environments. People in other countries don't have exactly the same problems because they've structured their environment somewhat differently. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And just like when you hang around with a group of people, you, you tend to get influenced from that group uh, directly or indirectly in many ways. And all of a sudden you, you start to see yourself either saying similar things or picking up those behaviors. So, so I guess, it, I, I guess that's, that's just another really good way to think about some bad habits um, that you want to change. You got to really, really evaluate your environment. And I like the whole approach of cleanliness. And you even think like when you're like winters here in Chicago, my truck was a mess just from snow and all this stuff. And this weekend I went to clean it and I just felt so much more organized. <laughs> the environment changed. So it's just, it's just those little things. It's amazing how they add up. It is. And you're absolutely right. The, the other people around us are also part of our environment. Um, and so they influence us as well. But the built environment, um, people walk more if they live in neighborhoods that are pedestrian friendly, that have sidewalks. People ride bikes more if they live in neighborhoods where there are protected bike lanes. We think well, people have to want these things before we build them. But actually, there's a big influence on the environment on what we want and what we're willing to do. And walking and riding bikes is good for our health. It's good for the environment. These are things that we can adopt once we understand how influenced we are by what's around us. Well... At that, I know uh, I know you got to run, and I can't thank you enough for this conversation and your wisdom. Uh, hands down, the best book on habits I've ever read. Highly recommend it. Good habits, bad habits. That's the name of it. Get it on Amazon. Do Do you also um, have a website that you want to direct people to? Well, I I post on Twitter and Instagram, and I do. Um, hope people will follow because I post a lot of um, summaries and useful ways of using current habit research. So I try to get the word out there from the science in ways that people can understand and use in their own lives. So I hope people will pick up. Um, and, and what's your handle? Wendy? It's Prof. Wendy Wood. Okay. So Twitter, it's at Prof. Wendy Wood. Instagram. Okay. And I'll make sure to link that in the show notes. Again, uh, I know you got to run, but thank you so much for your time today. Congrats on the book. Fantastic job. And, uh, and I can't recommend it enough. Thank you so much. You're really very kind. It's lovely talking with you. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing this air. Thank you for tuning in to the Not Almost There podcast. It is so great to have you again. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, please do. That is such a great way to support the show. Also, another great way is to share this content with someone. Undoubtedly, there's someone out there that can get something out of these podcasts. And 
you sharing them being an ambassador means more to us than anything. Also, your feedback is always welcome. So please leave it either in a review or on our website at notalmostthere.com. Thank you again for being here and we look forward to an amazing year ahead. Have a great and awesome productive week.